through good time management. We've got plenty of time for a bit of discussion and questions. I know there is a microphone somewhere. There it is up the back corner. Um, so we're open for questions. Um, we've got a microphone there. Anyone want to engage? Is that one? There seems to be one there. It's, sorry, it's very hard to see with the lights coming straight at you. Thank you. G'day, um, thanks for that, guys. Peter Parbury from Depi in Victoria. I have a question for Isabel. Um, we heard that uh, animal welfare is one of the uh, key concerns among community, and certainly that's an area where dairy uh, has potential for people to raise concerns. I was surprised that, that animal welfare wasn't part of your uh, strategy. What, what's your uh, strategy around animal welfare and communicating with the public on that? Um, it will be part of the strategy. I think uh, we will recognise that when you engage in a strategy around animal welfare, you need to tread very carefully and know what you're doing. So it's not something that we wanted to launch and rush into to, to, to start with, and, um, but it's definitely something that we will be building communications around and, um, you know, on the basis of being transparent and, and know what our practices are. So, uh, no, we haven't covered it yet. We've only really just launched in with communications, but, yeah, we're very aware that's something that we will, we will need to cover off as we go because um, that's about connecting with, with our consumer audience as well. Okay, we've got another question. It's going to take a while. Oh, no, the microphone is... We're going to get him fit by the end of this. He's coming around there now. If you grab the microphone off the questioner, uh, I'll be able to send you to the next one. That'll save a bit of time. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mick. Jeff Akers, and I guess my question's to Jackie. And thanks for the presentation. And, and I've been thinking a bit about some of the things you said and uh, what we think about in Australian agriculture and the things like uh, no added hormones, uh, south door free, um, animal welfare, and uh, customers won't pay any more. And, um, and as a farmer, I guess you think about the costs associated with those sort of things. And I guess the question's about the other products that you've got in your supermarkets that uh, aren't produced in Australia, that we've actually got to uh, sell our product against. So if you've got some comment on them and the sort of standards that as a supermarket you're placing on those products you're bringing into the country because as we continue to sign more free trade agreements, we're going to have more of those sort of products come in that we as farmers have got to uh, compete against. Okay, that's a good question. So um, our program on, on sustainability um, and responsible sourcing is, is very focused at the primary end initially because that's where customers are expecting that degree of transparency. They understand milk, dairy, meat, fruit and veg fresh much more so than they might understand dried fruit in breakfast cereal, for example. So um, in terms of all our, of all our policies and programs, they don't change depending on country of origin. So if we take fresh pork, for example, or pork being imported into the country to go in our hams and bacons. They all have to come in according to that sales store free standard and it's all audited internationally. So there's no difference in that position. But clearly when you come to things like, um, I don't know, canned fruit, I suppose, where we've got a South African offer and we've got an Australian offer, we're moving as much as we can back to Australia. There are volume <coughs> limitations here for us, um, but there's no no escaping the fact that cost of production in South Africa is cheaper than cost of production in Australia. And it's, we can't really influence that. We can try to drive as much positive messaging around why they should choose Australian first. And we can invest, as we do, out of our own profit margins to maintain that price point as, as, to as value a proposition as we can. But it's for the industry to help play a part as well in saying to customers, you know, why would you want to get an Australian canned peach rather than a South African canned peach? And I think one of the insights we've had in that space is that, you know, we know that if it was a fresh peach, they would be very focused on Australian. When it gets more processed, they become less and less focused. And if it doesn't match for quality, like for like, they will go to the imported version. And we saw that in canned fruit. Now, we're about to move our canned fruit back to Australian. Um, and we've got a huge amount of work to do to make sure we can get the quality in the can 
as good as the quality that was coming out of South Africa. And that's, you know, that's a real challenge for us and for the, for the industry and the growers. But we're, we're committed to trying to do that. Um, but, but whether the customer, at the end of the day, whether the customer will really, it's hard to put the price, hard to know how much the customer might be prepared to pay just to have it Australian. If it's less good quality, I suspect they won't be prepared to buy it. That's the reality of the situation. But where, but where, um, but in terms of does the food safety requirements of the factories in South Africa and Australia have to be the same? Is it audited to the same standards? Are the policies around use of pesticides and all the rest of it in the farms the same? Yes, they are, and we audit to the same level. But you're dealing with a country whose cost of production is cheaper. Uh, if that helps answer you? your question. I think, I think the most important thing for us is to, is to maintain the commitment that we have and to be, drive as hard through all our communication messages to customers that we want to have Australian. And my message to the industry is if you, if you can produce it, you know, we, we, we really want to try and sell it. And we want to buy more Australian pork and we want to buy, we buy all our beef and lamb and poultry in Australia anyway. And, and over 90% of our fresh produce as well. Question. Uh, Jane Bennett from Tasmania. Um, my question is a bit of a follow-on to Jackie. Um, it would be quite beneficial, I think, for, for people from the industry to understand Cole's perspective and, and what's the tipping point that changes your buying behaviour um, and leads you to change um, practices. So you move from uh, to permeate free milk and um, Cole's branded uh, cage-free eggs as a buying policy. And, and how do you engage with industry before you make those changes um, to, to discuss the impact on production? Okay, well, I mean, we, we respond to cu what customers are telling us. So in the example of cage-free eggs, we had a huge amount of insights and a huge amount of... We, we talk to 10,000 customers a week through Tel Coles and we do all kinds of, of customer insight work and we have a very effective and probably the, the most effective retail customer complaint collection system in the country. So we knew what customers wanted us to do. We did research that told us that, you know, over 70% of our consumers would rather buy uh, non-caged eggs, but they found that the price point was too challenging. And so we worked with our suppliers, the suppliers to us of Carl's Brand Eggs, to um, adjust that price point to see what the impact was, and the impact was a real willingness to move. So we were then able to um, justify, I guess, a, a need state for the customer and know that if we could convert our Coles brand offer out of cage, that we would attract customer loyalty and it would drive quality and it would drive our perception and we would, we would grow market share and we would grow total sale of eggs in our business. Um, in terms then of how we did that, we, uh, it was a project that I led, so we started with you know, a global benchmark of all standards. We talked to various stakeholders, welfare groups, DPI, uh, suppliers. We then drafted a standard. We then put that out for consultation. We then came to a point where we agreed it. We then um, set a timeline to transfer those farms. Uh, and it took two and a half years. And then we audited them all. Um, and so it was done in collaboration. It was done um, willingly. Um, and I guess, I don't know if there are any of those egg producers in the room, but I mean, we have a very, very strong position around that and a very supportive position <laughs> from, our, from our farmers in that space. Um, we support, you know, we provided financial support through various different channels, investments, um, contracts, change to, change to contract terms, uh, uh, rise and fall clauses, you know, they're individual depending on the individual producer and their particular status. Um, but all that is negotiated individually within the business through the buying departments, through the buying teams, uh, with myself as the, as I guess the project lead in terms of the policies and the standards. So none of it would be done without customers telling us it was what they want us to do. And all of the projects that, that certainly we've done in the last three to five years have all been done in consultation with our producer base, but only with our producer base because it's our producer base that we're working with in our private label offer. Um, um, a question up in the middle. Rob Brokenshire, dairy farmer from South Australia. Uh, when you talk, Jackie, about price sensitivity, um, if you look at the Down Down Milk campaign, which um, 
clear evidence shows that people were not calling for that to come down to a dollar a litre and in fact a number of your consumers pay more than a dollar a litre deliberately. Uh, but you were looking at that, I believe, as a lost leader product to bring people into your store. Uh, that has devalued th uh, the value of the brand dairy, uh, and it's not sustainable for dairy farmers and processors to um, actually produce that milk continually down, down and down and not going up at a dollar. Uh, what's Cole's plan to ensure that the, the dairy industry is not destabilised in its domestic market because of your deliberate... Um, push to put that milk down to a dollar a litre and keep it at a dollar a litre? Well, I think that's probably a subject we'd be better off to take outside of the room. I mean, we've done our value chain work and we have moved all our, our supply contracts in the last year to a situation that both those producers and our, our business feel is sustainable. But I'm not, you know, I don't have all those financial details with me and I wouldn't be privy to them. Um, in terms of the amount of Australian dairy production that we as a business take, it, it would be really very small in the grand scheme of things. Um, but we don't believe that we have created a destabilised position. In fact, our producers, the producers we're working with and the farmers we're working directly with on that milk supply are happy to supply us. Uh, up the side. Hello, uh, Lionel Lothieu, Nanfield Scholar from France. My question is, um, how to produce more with less, with uh, integrate um, greening environment, and if customer didn't pay more? So, so the question was, how can farmers produce more with less when customers are demanding that they don't have to pay any more? Um, and caring, and green as well, sorry. Um, does anyone want to have a go at that? Jackie, it might be directed at you, I think. Uh, look, I think it's, it's... The analogy I would draw is, you know, we all buy cars, and every time we buy a car, we expect it to be... We pay less for it in real terms, and we expect it to be more. We're only, we are dealing with what we all as consumers are expecting. So we have to look at all our efficiencies, we have to look, invest in technology, we have to do all the, all the R&D that's required to get you know, more disease-resistant species or to get higher levels of productivity. Um, and it is a balancing act, there's no doubt about it. And I think ultimately, you know, to say customers won't pay more, I mean, customers will have to pay the true price of food production. That's the reality of the matter. The biggest opportunity for us is probably to waste less and to ensure that all the practices that we adopt in the chain, and I think all of us that work in the chain know that all of the chain is not adopting all of the best practices. And it's probably the tail that's the biggest opportunity for change. And we see that as we get out to farm. And if you could get that longer tail as you know, informed and able and capable of, of doing the best practice that many and probably most in this room are doing, it would be a significant step forward. And unfortunately, in, in you know, the world of the consumer, it's the weakest link that will be your downfall. And we all know that, because we've handled you know, food safety issues or poor agricultural practice issues, and it scars the whole industry. But it's you know, a tiny proportion of the industry that's, that's going to, that, that we need to move forward. It, it's, it's a global challenge, there's no doubt. The biggest opportunity to, to address the um, world food shortage over the next 50 years is to waste less food. We could, we could solve half of that need if globally we, we, we waste less. So for us, by getting to the farm, knowing the farm, trying to take all the crop, trying to utilise all the crop, work on seasonal peaks and troughs, invest, so there's less, you know, there's job example. That rain, that, that weather protection there prevents that fruit getting bruised in the rain. That is a 40% change in his waste levels on that farm, much of which was wasted at our stores. So, you know, that's just waste whatever way you look at it. He shouldn't have picked it or packed it. We shouldn't have distributed it and we couldn't sell it. So it's just a waste. If we can now, we'll now be able to sell that product, you know, by us throwing it out, he doesn't get paid for it. It's bottom line. Even if it's not that time, it's the next time. So that's really where I think one of the biggest opportunities are. And that could relate to, you know, carcass quality of of livestock, eating quality, all of those elements that I just think we need to do a, um, continue to, to investigate and do research in so that we get 100% of the product used 100% of the time. 
can't see any more questions. I think one of the interesting questions for me right across the board for all speakers is, uh, in a sense, the exhortation is to respond to consumers and respond to the general public and their expectations. But I think, as Ross said, sometimes those expectations are grounded in Pandora somewhere, uh, which are impossible to, to meet. So, and, and I think sometimes those expectations are uh, generated through, uh, shall we say, activist campaigns rather than necessarily the consumer. So if we looked at HGPs, if we looked at sow stalls, uh, I think probably 80, 90 per cent of consumers wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about, but, but activist groups effectively can, uh, can bring that to people's attention and, and mount campaigns and require a response of industry. I'm, I'm interested in all of you uh, responding or, or, or answering the question, how does industry deal with that sort of situation where, where it seems as if um, the community expectations are in fact cannot, cannot be met or, or cannot be reasonably uh, dealt with? What, where's the approach there? challenge, Mick, and I think um, it's identified in, in this little conversation too about what is, it really comes down to the question of what is best practice and how is that going to end up being defined and uh, whoever intervened from up there about Australia's best practice not necessarily mirroring the same best practice coming in is exactly right certainly in our industry. Uh, for example, uh, we, we deal in cross uh, AFA we deal cover everyone from the growers to the processors to the big pulp and paper makers and we had a very big issue recently with uh, alleged recycled paper um, coming into Australia which was beating the Australian recycled paper um, because it had a different recycled content without boring you with the detail. So, so it could come in under, under the auspices when, and our paper wasn't deemed good enough. The qualities are quite different right across the board but I do, do think the big Flashpoint for us, especially with those who take all of our products, and Coles doesn't take a lot of timber at the moment, but we have very big, um, big receivers of our product who are driven by all sorts of activism towards uh, areas which are not to do with best practice but just to do with best sales. Um, there's various uh, certification schemes, for example, that, is, that are existing now or springing up, finding their way into the industry which have more to do with shelf space than they have to do with any science of forestry or sustainable management practices. And they're the things where I think, that's what I was trying to kind of say in my talk, I think that's where we're going to find the, the difficulty as we go forward and try to grow our sectors because as we impose these things and for all the good reasons that we've heard about and they're very valid and, and understandable <laughs> reasons in terms of the home market, there is just no way to impose these same sort of standards on overseas supply chains. Certainly speaking from our sector, I've been and had a look and uh, we're held to a different standard. So, so I, I do think that um, that's going to be our greatest area of challenge to get that message uh, out in our industry, you know, what is a sustainable best practice and it may not meet everyone's expectations. Isabel? Um, I guess I, I take a, a slightly different approach um, in, in your talk about responding to what consumers want. And I think it's um, a, a responsibility if, if we know and we're confident in our practices and, and our efficiencies and, and the way we run our business is understanding the consumer, uh, engaging with them, but leading the debate rather than just responding. And, um, uh, and, and that's a different, you know, you can get caught into a response cycle and, and find yourself down a track it actually doesn't make very good business sense or might jeopardise some of the practices that you have in place. But I think understanding where a, a customer is coming from and the, and the values and the needs that they see, but also running your own story is, is really important. Because um, uh, I think there is a trap. Um, because perception does become reality at the end of the day. Um, but I think there's a, a real value in engaging in much more a personal conversation with your, with your customers and consumers. Um, and being very grounded in, in your story as an industry and being able to take that forward. But would that, I mean, if you looked at the dairy industry, you'd say the treatment of male bobby calves is probably a flashpoint that's potentially touchy. Mm. Uh, I mean, would that extend to explaining why <laughs> male bobby calves are treated the way they are? Or how far do you go down that track? Um, well, I think we really have to start to address that in the future um, because it is the, um, someone raised it before um, about talking about animal welfare and um, 
I mean, some of these issues are real farming practice issues, and it's, it's part of an agricultural system. And, and I think it's something that we need to get our head around explaining. And it was interesting, last week we were visited at the Australian Dairy Conference by one of the biggest farmers in the US who, who milks 40,000 cows at Fair Oaks Farm in Illinois. Now that's hugely intensive farming, but their approach to customer engagement is giving them a full experience of that intensive farming system, and everything's open for discussion. And um, they have very little activist um, reaction. They have to deal with very few calls about their business because they're very confident in their practices and they're very open um, in discussing that. And I think we need to we need to take that view as well. Mm. San, do you have any? insights from your research about? Um, I think, um, Mig, I th uh, from what, what we saw, I, I think we're still at a fairly early stage. I mean, obviously, uh, all, the, all the different industries have been trying to understand what consumers want for, um, you know, since time immemorial. But we're at, I think we're at, we're at an early stage of really getting to what these expectations are. And I think there's opportunities for sort of more novel approaches um, to, to getting at that. We, we're not um, we're not going to get it all from um, market research, as, as I said earlier. Um, at the moment, the, the retailers are really playing that, that role of, as they should and as they need to, um, but trying to align community and um, industry. Um, and and that, I think that needs to be um, a role that, that industry you know, takes on more as well. Um, so I guess novel approaches like um, there's some examples um, from the US where uh, you know people are actually you know staying on farms and um, getting involved in GM uh, labs, you know housewives getting in invited into GM labs, all sorts of things that really mix it up and and sort of share what what is the industry and we get a deeper understanding of what's really, you know, it could go, could make things worse, but then we understand, um, you know, where things can go. So I think, I, th I think we, we need to be, um, you know, exploring a, a, a number of different avenues in terms of really, really understanding what the community um, understands about farming and what it expects from it. Okay. Um, I'm getting a good run at questions here, aren't I? We've got another couple of minutes to go. Jackie, I might ask you a point that came up in your discussion was the, uh, the table that indicated consumers' preference for, certainly in the fresh produce area, Australian grown. Um, do you think the industry here does enough to talk about the inherent credence values of product uh, to support that notion? Do you think we're, 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 we're mining uh, a goodwill that may well evaporate uh, if we're not careful? Um, it's, it's interesting that, that we, you know, we would sell 90%, 97, I think 95, 97% of our fresh produce is grown in Australia and customers think it would be less than 40%. So there's clearly a gap in what mm. is happening versus what customers think is happening. Now whether that's they, I don't, I'm assuming, and I haven't got the facts in front of me, and that might just be for supermarkets. If they go to their local farmer's market, they probably realise it's 100% Australian. So yes, I do think there's more we need to do. Um, because if customers understood the care and attention that I think is being taken, I guess my insight would be that not everyone is taking that care and attention. And that's the reality of what I see on farm. And my, I guess, position on this, uh, advice on this is, you know, as an industry, we need to be sure that we are absolutely the best we can be. And we have to hold ourselves to account if we've got people in the mix that are not performing. Because it will be those people that will get photographed on social media and that will become the norm and that will become the customer's understanding of what's going on. And it's only us that can stop that happening. I think if I just as well go back to the, the comment about um, lobby groups and NGOs, I think um, my advice is to engage with them because you know, they're not, they can make a lot of noise, but only two, one or two or maybe three of them are really, really recognised by most consumers, you know, really able to make a massive change. We would work very closely with all of them. 
Um, I think it's, it's an oversimplification to suggest that the, the retailer or the brand owners you know, jump from one initiative to another based on what an NGO would ask them to do or suggest that they do. Our job is to respond to what customers are asking us to do. Now, if the NGO campaigns are successful in translating customers' needs, then we have to respond to that. <coughs> but I think there's a piece the about engaging with them yeah. properly to make sure that they are well informed in what they're campaigning about. And we try our best to do that. But I have to say, I don't see that much of the agricultural chain doing that, if I'm honest. Ross, I think you had an Sorry. interjection there. Shouldn't have been interjected. That, uh, just it's such a, such a difficult issue for the forestry industry because um, without speaking across the broad sector here, just, just what we have to do uh, is largely the best practice looks bad. Okay, to, and, and that, that's our You mean struggle. cutting down trees? Yeah. yeah. And the way, the way you do it to, to maximise the, the regeneration of, the, of an area doesn't look great. The best, best practice, best visual practice is completely uneconomic. We'll, we might as well drop it out of Australia's eco economy. So it just we get ter terribly fearful of, um, and I know Jackie wasn't saying this directly, but that's why I jumped in, is, is there is a, an ability to move especially city perception, which was the point of my deck, uh, about what good practice in agriculture looks like. And we have to hold the line. We have to hold the line where science and well-respected international best practice is. Otherwise, we will have no agriculture sector in 20 years' time, in my view. Mm. On that uh, call to arms, <laughs> we're about at the end of our time. Uh, I'd ask the audience, uh, firstly, to thank Coles again for the sponsorship, but also to thank all our speakers for the session this afternoon. Thank you.